I hate to burst your bubble, you're not the only one with that idea. Whether this person has brains, guts, and heart, Vidya sure has a rigorous interviewing process. They're all gone, and uh, uh, we survived. The goal of winning is just so that you can play again. Even my ideas, the CEO's idea, is a bad idea. You can't uh, deliver a baby in, in a month with, with nine women. We're 30 days from going out of business. What you're about to see is Jensen Huang, the NVIDIA CEO from 2003, sharing his insights at Stanford University. With NVIDIA's tremendous success, everyone is chasing Jensen like a rock star. I got really curious and started digging up all his old speeches from before he became one of the most influential entrepreneurs in the world. This is a video you want to watch till the end because 21 years ago, he perfectly predicted what our technology and lives would look like in 2024. Get ready to have your mind blown. I enjoy talking to customers. Purpose of selling our products clearly, um, but also hearing what's wrong with our products. You know, the thing that I, you, you, people will hear me go right to uh, right away is, what are we doing wrong? Is obviously by understanding what's wrong with our company and what's wrong with our product, I can come back and fix it. And those are, those are uh, rather engineering behavior. The perpetual desire to fix things. I think that that's, that's a fine, fine thing to do. Your company is constantly you know, a fixer-upper, if you will. <laughs> in terms of competition, some of the competition is rather obvious, uh, but I think the, the most challenging thing about any company, any large company, is we don't know what we don't know. That is, in fact, the most troubling of all. In terms of the obvious competitors, uh, Intel is a competitor of ours, Sony is a competitor of ours. Um, we have competition from all over the world still, and so uh, what, what we need to figure out a way to do simultaneously as, as, the, as the irony has it, you want to simultaneously discover a larger market footprint, therefore reducing your market share, while re increasing your market share. And so that constant discovery of expanding your market footprint while capturing uh, market share through competitive products is a, is a 24 hour job, and it's, it's fun. In order to keep your company on the top, the, the, the employees should realize that there are other competitors having equally brainy engineers who are working on similar products. Uh, now, as a CEO of a company, what other motivational strategies do you have for employees so that your company is on the top? It is true there are great engineers everywhere, but it is the company's choice to figure out and decide who to let in and who not to. It is the company's choice to select among all of those great engineers. That choice ultimately goes into what the bucket I call culture. We are intensely selective in our company with respect to engineers. We hire, we make offers. This is a statistic that I just recently learned. We make offers to one-tenth, 10% of the people we interview. Out of those 10%, 95% accept our offers. And so we happen to be intensely selective when it comes down to the people that we, we bring to our company. Not just alone in their intelligence, but also their heart, you know, and also their courage. We try to figure out whether this person has brains, guts, and heart in the process of the interview. And that's why people say, gee, NVIDIA sure has a rigorous interviewing process. It's because we're trying to select the people that we want to work with. Not everybody likes working at NVIDIA. Not everybody gets to come. Not everybody has to stay. But the people that do love working there because we give them terrific projects. We give them extraordinary resources. And we also give them teammates that they know they can count on. That, I think, falls into the realm of culture. And that sets us apart. The reason why a lot of people in the Silicon Valley think that we have one of the best engineering organizations in the world is because of that, that self-selection process that makes it possible for us to retain quality. You talk a little more about how you, how you convey your vision to your employees and how you keep that sense of urgency in them so that they continue improving themselves? In terms of uh, how do we communicate a sense of urgency? Just through action. They have to see that when I, when I make decisions or when I do something, that I do it with a sense of urgency. And it's amazing what, what that does. People, people simply pick up those habits from you. If your CEO works hard, you'll work hard. If your CEO cares, you'll care. If your CEO loves this company, you'll love this company. If your CEO is passionate about the work that we do, you'll be passionate about the work that we do. If your CEO does everything with an extraordinary sense of purpose and, and, and intensity and sense of urgency, you will too. 
the behavior and the values and, and the habits of that leader uh, has an amazing way of rubbing off on everybody else. And I was just asked a question earlier, you know, what do entrepreneurs do when you have a great idea? Um, I hate to burst your bubble, you're not the only one with that idea. It is very likely that if it's a great idea, a lot of people have that same idea. Uh, and in fact, when NVIDIA first started as a company, we were the first consumer 3D graphics company started in the world, and, and, and we started the company in Silicon Valley. Uh, within about 60 days, and certainly we didn't go out telling everybody when we started this company, within 60 days or so, there were 50 other companies doing it. Today, they're, they're, they're all gone, and uh, uh, we survived. But nonetheless, a lot of great people come up with great ideas at about the same time. The question has to do with um, our business historically. We are so incredibly well known for one thing that we do, making the GeForce GPU. You know, we are known in high schools and video game parlors and in every country all over the world. I get, I get uh, fan mails uh, almost <laughs> every country I go to. And um, I, I'm particularly popular with the teenagers, it appears. Uh, and so we need to be careful not to reposition our company so drastically that we dilute what we mean to a core audience that cares deeply about us. Okay, so it's a balancing act that is, in fact, rather hard to do. Intel's business today is not predominantly CPUs anymore. It's a very important part of their business. It is the predominant part of their profits, but yet they do a lot more than that, and yet we today still think of Intel as a CPU company. They're trying to balance that very delicately, and I need to balance that very delicately as well, to reposition the company into a much larger market while retaining the identity of our company that the whole world knows us by. When I come back in 10 years, if I get invited, invited back in 10 years, um, I hope that I'm driving a lot more of those pixels. And what people see us as uh, maybe is, is just a much broader uh, consumer electronics company and a broader technology company and hopefully one of the most influential technology companies in the world. Execution certainly matters a great deal. And I think that, that um, within your, your question is in fact a fact that uh, having simpler ideas that you can execute perfectly is sometimes better than having a grandiose idea that your company can't execute on. Okay, and so when you get large as a company and when you're trying to do complicated things, uh, in fact, it is best, it is most prudent to keep it simple. Many ideas surface, and, and a lot of people say, Jensen, why didn't you guys do this? Why didn't you do this? Or our engineers ask, you know, why didn't we put this feature in? We could have done all that. I mean, it wasn't because we didn't have the ability to have the, the idea. You have to decide as a company, you have to decide as an as a, uh, engineering team or, or as an innovator to say, you know what, I don't need to change the world overnight. I'm going to change the world over the next 50 years. I don't need to build a killer product overnight. I just need to build a winning product. And the goal of winning is so that you can play again. It's just like pinball. Okay? If you could just play well enough to get another game, you could be there for a long time. With every single architecture, one of the things that we ask ourselves right off the bat is, what is the purpose of its existence? What is the soul of this product? I think that that's one of the things that we've done really, really terrifically in our company. Because most of our products have brand names, and most of these brand names are so sought after uh, and so worldwide recognized that we've really given our products, these semiconductor devices, a personality. Uh, you want to create an environment where anybody can have a good idea. Uh, you want to create an environment where even my ideas, the CEO's idea, uh, is a bad idea. And I think that um, uh, you want to create an environment that is uh, able to uh, see adversity as an opportunity instead of as, as a life-threatening event. Um, and I think if you, if you could figure out a way to do that uh, and encourage people to take calculated risks and often, uh, when, you, uh, you know, when you take calculated risks often, you will create mistakes often. And when you see those mistakes as opportunity, you will get a lot of ideas often. I think that's just the bottom line. So the question has to do with, with the dichotomy between um, revaluation, uh, being self-critical, um, constantly, constant, constantly looking at the market and adjusting yourself as needed, versus building something of extraordinary complexity that takes two years to do. Okay? In order to build anything meaningful, you have to be committed to it. 
Two years ago, when we started building GeForce FX, the idea of building GeForce FX was, was completely, utterly nonsense. Nobody asked us to build it. Not a single customer said they wanted it. And, um, uh, and yet, you need to have the courage uh, to go forward with executing what you and doing what you believe is something that you're excited about. I mean, there's a little bit of, you know, self-entertaining that goes with building any company. I, I won't, I won't deny that. You know, I build GeForce FX first for me, and then second for my customers, and I hope that they buy some. So you need to have a passion, you need to have a vision, and you need to have some courage to go forward with it. Once you commit yourself to that, unless it's something pretty dramatic. It, and you don't commit yourself to a $300 million program lightly, okay? You, you really have to believe in it. Once you commit to it, it's very unlikely that I see something that's going to cause me to veer away from it, okay? And so I think that, that um, it's no different than your hobbies or, you know, something that you care deeply about. Even though everybody tells you it's the wrong thing to do, you are absolutely convinced of it. You've got to go pursue that. You've got to go after that vision. Your corporate culture is probably the single most important thing as a CEO or as an entrepreneur. Uh, you ought to invest your time in. And that corporate culture, uh, in our case, is about intellectual honesty. Intellectual honesty, to us, mean that we have the ability to be self-critical, that we have the ability to recognize we've made mistakes, that we have the ability to recognize that, in fact, unless we do something, we're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. Okay, so those kind of intellectual honesty uh, is really relevant, I think, in the building of companies today. And recognizing that as a leader in this company, that your employees have the ability to take the criticism, that they have the confidence to know that they're not on top of the world and that they have constant threat. That attitude, I think, is pretty important. A search for a fundamental advantage, and this is what everybody does. Every company um, is constantly looking for it. Every manager is asking you for it. I think the interesting thing is that, in fact, there are no fundamental advantages, you know, unless you have a monopoly or you know, unless you, you, you somehow carved out an airwave uh, that nobody else can get to. By and large, the majority of large markets are very uh, supportive of competition. And the majority of your customers, and the larger you become and the more relevant you become, are going to want to encourage more competition. And so there are no fundamental competitive advantages. So the question that for you then is, is how do you create ongoing advantages in your company? You think you've got great engineers? Everybody's got great engineers. You know, Stanford University pumps out a great deal of very high caliber engineers, but so does MIT, and so does Carnegie Mellon, and so does USC. Many, many universities pump out great engineers. And today, the great engineers all have great tools, and it's very likely they all have pretty good funding. And so the challenge then is, now your idea is not unique. You also haven't discovered some kind of a fundamental secret sauce, and you know that your team although extraordinary, and you're re really proud of them, is by and large no better than anybody else's team. Everybody's got a salary cap. Everybody's got the same number of it. You know, how many engineers does it take to build a chip? And can, can you add 10,000 engineers to build a single chip? So it's, it's along the lines of how many, how many uh, what, what is the phrase of, of saying, you know, it, you, you can't uh, deliver a baby in, in a month with, with nine women. I mean, I think, I think the same thing, same thing applies with engineering. Okay, at some level, having 10 times more engineer is not helpful. What that really says is, you know, in, in the 10 years that I've been at NVIDIA, there's not been a single thing that I can currently put my finger on that can tell you is the sustainable idea since our beginning. Not one. Every single good idea we invented last 30 days. Our employees will say, Jensen's always telling us we're 30 days from going out of business. Uh, we, we have a billion dollars in the bank today. We're not really going to go out of business in 30 days. The idea, the notion that you have to reinvent yourself every 30 days is a very important one. The idea that the world changes so rapidly. So whatever techniques and whatever advantages or whatever technology you had or whatever strategies you had are really, in fact, going to be obsolete 30 days from now. And so you have to stay on your toes. You have to innovate constantly. And you have to assume that you're going out of business every 30 days. There are, in fact, interesting technologies. But one of the interesting technologies is um, extremely lightweight displays that, that um, you put on as goggles with head tracking. And so all of a sudden, you are immersed in a 3D environment, not by, communi not by moving joysticks or the mouse or you know, keyboards or whatever it is, just by, by looking around. Um, that has, in fact, a, a quite an amazing ability to suspend you in disbelief.
The technology exists today is rather expensive. Um, the lightweight ones with high resolution is extremely expensive, but it does exist today. There's no question that, that uh, this type of technology will be available in the future. The question is what's beyond that. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you that, that I don't know, um, but I'm certain that as I get closer, I'll discover it. In terms of engineers around the world, it is true that India and China, particularly those two countries, um, generate and produce some of the finest students uh, in the world. Culturally, those two countries take education extremely, extremely seriously. I would say that, that China even more so. I happen to be a bit more enthusiastic about our long-term viability um, because I do believe that this is not an industry that is particularly scalable, meaning that having a thousand engineers is not necessarily uh, the most important thing to have. Having the right engineers, having the right culture, uh, being close to the events, unfortunately. You know, being, being near Silicon Valley, being close to uh, a spirit of innovation, I think is rather important. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some parts of our engineering work that can't be outsourced to the international uh, arena. In our particular case, in the case of NVIDIA, we just haven't learned how to do it yet. Where are we going to go from here? When we first started the company about 10 years ago, the majority of us see pixels, see graphics from a CRT. All of the computers at NVIDIA were CRT-based. All of the computers in our demo room were CRT-based. CRT-based computing fundamentally has a chal is, is challenged from a transportability perspective, it's challenged from a miniaturization perspective, and it's challenged from a cost perspective. It will never, ever be light, it will never be cheap, it will never be everywhere. And yet, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, LCD technology, powered by semiconductor technology, is now everywhere. The LCD technology and, of course, in the future, other type of, uh, type of uh, technologies as OLEDs um, will make displays more and more prevalent. And the last, last uh, thing that I learned is that um, uh, the IPO is, in fact, not guaranteed. At the time that you came up with the idea, the road between that idea to going public uh, is such a long road that if that is the reason why you're doing it, you're going to have a very hard time. And, and for a lot of people that start companies, or even companies that go public and then subsequently went out of business, uh, if that is the purpose for you doing it, uh, I think that you're going to find that you're going to be heartbroken many times along the way. And you're going to break the hearts of a lot of people who have trusted you and break the hearts of a lot of people who have followed you. So you have to do it for the right reason. But certainly my right reason, the reason for our company, has been to build a company that is sustainable, build a company that is influential, build a company that is respected. And ultimately, for us, what it was all about was building a company that made a difference. And so, you know, for us, that was our reason, and that was our reason that's good enough any day. Whether you're about to go out of business, that's a great reason. Whether you're, uh, where you're on top of the world and your stock is trading at whatever it is, that's a great reason. Um, or the next day when, when uh, the investors decide that they no longer like your company, uh, although nothing fundamentally changed, um, that's also a great reason. So you, you need to find yourself a reason that can survive the swings in the economy, the swings in, in uh, the stock market, and the swings in competition. And so that's, uh, that's my uh, last slide.